The base is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down Here. It's a Tuesday. It is the Tuesday tune-up. We'll get you ready for the day. And it's kind of a weird one with lots of different things bubbling up. Uh, Moises Caicedo, a player we've talked about quite a bit here in SDH land, uh, was all expected to go to Manchester United. It was just a matter of time. They had all the control of the deal. Well, now an MLS team might get involved. I wonder who it is. I don't know. I, it, it's an interesting one. We'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into uh, Bombas in Spain, where Sergio Ramos is telling the president of Real Madrid, uh, yeah, another club told me this. And it's pretty cool. So we'll get into that. We'll get into uh, Frank Lampard stuff, because it's out there. We'll, we'll get into the Gummy Bear Cup semifinals, because they're coming. We'll get into the Copa Libertadores. That's coming. Everybody's yelling about Inter Miami or Inter Milan or Inter whoever, Inter Nacional in Brazil or Inter Atlanta or Inter Nashville, and that's all going on. So we'll get into all of that. Tons of stuff to talk about. We'll get into all of it. You guys have questions. You know how to do this. You, you tweet at us at soccer down here. You email us soccer down here at Gmail, or you join us on the Twitch pitch, twitch.tv slash soccer down here. There's so many different places we could go, John. Um, you get the honors of where you want to start today. Let's go Lampard 2.0. What's the latest? Um, I mean, latest probably there isn't much. Uh, we're still kind of waiting to see. Settle down, computer. We're still kind of waiting to see what uh, will happen because he's got a couple games coming up where he's going to have a chance to, to prove himself. But... The the last couple of things that have been said, and we talked about it last night uh, at the end of soccer over there, the independent and Leighton sport have both had two different rumors about potential replacements for Frank Lampard. Uh, the independent had more detail on it. They said that Chelsea are willing to give Lampard more time as manager, but the situation's under constant review, and I think that review gets pretty strong uh, during the Leicester match here coming up in a couple weeks. The Independent listed Thomas Tuchel, Max Allegri, no surprise, as possible options if Lampard is dismissed. Brendan Rodgers' name came up. Ralph Hasenhutl's name came up, which are both very interesting. Leighton Sport included Andrei Shevchenko in this mix. Now, Shevchenko is friends with Abramovich, I, I believe. Uh, Abramovich brought him in as a player. Mourinho didn't want him. It, it, that created some friction. Uh, Shevchenko's time at Chelsea didn't go like anybody hoped it would. Legend in Italy, legend with Ukraine. He is the current manager of the Ukraine national team. Uh, if Abramovich came in, he'd probably pay him well, and he'd potentially take it. That's interesting. That's a new one. Rodgers and Hasenhutl were new ones to this. Rodgers was linked to Arsenal when Mikel Arteta was in trouble. Rodgers is kind of linked to a bigger club than he's at generally because he's shown a, a, you know, a want to do that at times. Would he leave Leicester where they are to jump to Chelsea where they might be behind them in the table? I don't know. Uh, that would be a pretty bold move, and he better know that he's getting it right because it's going to be frowned upon would be generous um, <laughs> yeah. by lots of people. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Hassan Hutzel is a, a really interesting one because, as as Nick Alifi said last night, you know, when it comes to Tuchel, when it comes to Allegri, when it comes to Shevchenko, is the new Brexit situation going to affect them getting work permits? I don't know what that looks like for managers. I, I don't know how that would affect it. For Rodgers and for Hassan Hutzel, it would not. And while it would be very tricky for Rodgers to probably – go to a team behind his current team in the table. I don't know if that'll be the case for Hassan Hutel, although it could be, depending on how things go. I mean, does any of that jump out to you as, as possible, or are we still just waiting to see what happens with Chelsea first? I'm still waiting for Chelsea, although I look at Hassan Hutel, and I know that because of what we're seeing with Southampton recently, uh, he, it makes sense to put him on the list, but my question for Hassan Huttel would be, because of everything that you've built at Southampton, the trust that they've enlisted in you, and I'll go back to the Leicester game from last season, they stuck with you, and you've taken Southampton to where they are currently. Would you want to go 
considering everything that the front office and the ownership at Southampton have given you from a trust perspective and you've gotten them to here? Would you want to continue to see that through or would you want to jump to Chelsea? That's why I thought that Hassan Tuttle, while interesting, he would be at the bottom of my list. But yeah, Nick's point about hold anybody outside. Hold up, outside. hold up, hold up. On sure. that. See it through. What does see it through mean at Southampton? Getting them into European football. That's it? That's the and ceiling? That's the first step. No, 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 no. So he's going to turn Southampton into a perennial Premier League winner? No, no. Would he turn Chelsea into that if he does well? I would imagine so, yes. That has to factor into this. I, I, I understand, like, you know, there's going to be some warm feelings towards Southampton, and there should be, but see it through, you could almost argue that he already has. You know, are, are they going to be much better than they are? And this isn't a knock on Southampton. It's just the reality of, of the game at this point. Cash rules everything around me, right? Chelsea's yeah. got a lot of cash. Um, yes, they do. Southampton is right now sixth in the table. They are on 29 points. They're in a gaggle with Tottenham, Manchester City, and Everton all on 29 points. Is this their ceiling, or could they go further? This year they might go further. This year is going to be a weird one. It looks like it's going to go down with a lot of teams late in the season. But in general, is Southampton going to be able to say on a yearly basis that they are ahead of Liverpool, Manchester United, We'll include Leicester, Tottenham, Manchester City, Chelsea. We'll include Arsenal in that. You can then put Everton and Villa and West Ham in the next mix. You could throw Leeds potentially moving up into that next mix. Is Southampton going to be able to consistently finish higher than Chelsea could? On a yearly basis, no. There's just no way. So if that job comes, it's going to be a pull for that. I don't know if that's enough. It might not be. Hassan Hultel might not be wired that way. But He's pretty close to his ceiling at Southampton, and it's nowhere near where it would be with Chelsea. So right. it is two very different things. Now, Rodgers, I don't know. You tell me. Is Leicester's ceiling higher than Southampton's? I feel like it is. Yeah. But how close is that ceiling to Chelsea's ceiling? And that I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you can consider Leicester in that power group at the top really consistently no questions asked because yeah. i think you do consider chelsea there because of the, yes. the financial weight and financial strength yeah no i'm right there with you i think that uh you know we we talked about big six or whatever it has been in the past who is the big six these days i don't know that's a question but the the, the stereotypic years past we've talked about the the big six those uh Manchester United, Manchester City, Liverpool, Chelsea. I mean, Arsenal was a part of that, you know, discussion. Arsenal and Tottenham. About- no, it, it's the big six is not changing year by year, and I think that's important because the big six is, is that six: the two Manchester clubs, Liverpool, mm-hmm. Tottenham, Chelsea, yeah, Tottenham. Arsenal. That's yeah. your big six. That's the clubs with the money. That's the clubs with the power. Do they always finish one through six? No. But that's the big six. Does Leicester make a true argument that it should be a big seven? They're getting close to that. Getting there, but they're not there yet. Are they the team more than anybody else that can argue that they should be in the big whatever number? I mean, could Everton argue that? Could Southampton argue that? Could Villa argue that? Could West Ham argue that? Could Leeds start to argue that? Could Wolves argue that? Newcastle has defaulted on arguing that. Sorry, Alex Bassine. Yes. I could say, I could see Leicester as a part of that discussion. Everton sample size is a little short right now under Ancelotti, it's but I not could see just, them going. Don't just base it on results. That, that's, that's, I think, where you can get messed up here because Leicester, I mean, it's got a league title. None of the others do. It's not just on results. It's on strength because the strength affects the quality of the job and the attractiveness of the job. And if you are at a second-tier team and doing well and a first-tier team comes calling... Yeah. you're having a different conversation. If another second-tier team comes calling, you're having a very different conversation. That has to be understood. 
Lester for me is the closest one. Yeah. To where for a Brendan Rodgers would really going to Chelsea be a huge step up. I'm not completely and utterly convinced of that. For Hasenhutl to do that, just in terms of beyond his what he wants to do as a coach, beyond the way he coaches, beyond any of that right now, just in terms of the job, it would be a step up. And it would be a, a decent step up, a pretty sizable step up. Now, Byrne brings up a good point on the Twitch pitch, and this would be something that you'd have to talk to Roman Abramovich about. Abramovich has made comments here and there over his time at Chelsea as to wanting to implement a style and wanting to have an identifiable style of play. Because Chelsea does not, and they haven't. I mean, you you go through the names of people who have been at Chelsea since Abramovich took over. You know, Mourinho, his different runs with the team, uh, scored a lot of goals early on, got more defensive later. You know, how much of a true style did he leave? Probably none, because I don't know if anybody really has. Um after Mourinho, you're talking about Gosvinik, Hudink. I mean, is uh, he was there for just short periods of time? Did he leave a style? No, not really, because he wasn't there long enough to do it. Yeah, said, yeah, I thought he was just more of a caretaker until the next guy came in more than anything. Carlo? Carlo's not known for leaving a style. Uh, Di Matteo was a caretaker, won the Champions League. Rafa? Not necessarily known for a style. He won the Europa League, but you know, did he leave something? Antonio Conte? You know, a lot of people rebelled against that. The, the, the three five two that he brought in and won a title with. And then it's like, no, we don't want that. Maurizio Sarri, I think, would have left the style. They didn't want it. They didn't want to go down that road. So there's this push-pull. Now, as Byrne points out, Hassan Hutel definitely has a philosophy. He's got a pure-pressing style. You know, and, and Burns says, I don't think Chelsea has the squad for it. And, and that could absolutely be an argument here. And that could be a reason why he says, you know what, I'd be setting myself up to fail. I don't want to go there, even though it's a bigger job. Right. He would have to truly get the buy-in. And Abramovich would have to, to really, truly commit, which he is not. He's talked about style. He got rid of Sarri in one year. You know, I mean, you know, you want to build a style, it takes more than one season. You, you want to go down the style with Antonio Conte, he was there for two seasons. I mean, come on. You know, you, you want to build a style, you got to commit. He says he wants to build a style. He's mentioned it over the years. He hasn't ever truly committed to it. So if you are a guy who is, this is my philosophy, this is what we do, it's going to take time to implement, Chelsea might not be the place for you. So while Hassan Hutel might like the idea of stepping up to a bigger team with more resources, it might not suit him. And that's a question for Chelsea, and, and I haven't seen Domer on the Twitch pitch this morning, but for Chelsea fans, I'd, I'd love to hear what you guys think about that, because, you know, what, the Abramovich era truly started with, with Jose, let's say, 2004. 2004 to now, you've got trophies, lots of them, lots of different ones, but how would you describe the Chelsea way? I don't think there is one outside of signing big talent. Yeah. And that's fine. That's, that's fine. If that's what you are, then you, that's fine. But is that what you want as a supporter of Chelsea? And I don't know. I, I don't have the answer to that. I'm, I'm not, so I, I can't tell you what they should want or shouldn't want. Hassan Hutel would be somebody more, and he's not like Sadri as a coach, but more in the idea of this is how we play as opposed to we're playing strictly to get a result here because we have a lot of talent. And that might not make him the best fit. I'm intrigued that his name has come up. And I would be intrigued to see where that might go. It might not go very far. But he would be one that would be a, a, a sea change, I think, for Chelsea if they truly committed to him. Allegri... Um, Makes sense. I mean, just in terms of he's a big name, he's won, he could slot right in, no problems there. Tuchel's also style, maybe not quite as rigid. And and, and you guys who, who follow the German game really close, tell me if that's not fair. 
it feels like what he did at PSG showed that he's got a little more versatility and he's got principles in the way he wants to play, but he can stretch to base off of the talent he has at hand. He's a, a great trainer. He's a great coach. He's also going to create a lot of friction, and that's something else that has come up tonight or this morning. Uh, last night, the Telegraph reported that Matt Law wrote that Chelsea had been warned off of Tuchel before he was looked at as a hire um, to replace Antonio Conte. And Chelsea was warned off of hiring him then because of the behind-the-scenes background stuff. He's a bad guy, remember? Yes. Um, the, the Telegraph and Matt Law pointed that out again. And, and they said, as, as everybody has reported, Chelsea's not hitting the panic button yet on Frank Lampard. But yeah, Tuchel, maybe they already have done their due diligence and they're like, eh, let's maybe yeah. stay away. But Tuchel's representation, Tuchel's agent, is going to be banging on that door because it is a big club that could have an opening very soon if things don't turn around. For me, where Chelsea is concerned, one of the, the points that's always there for me is Roman Abramovich. I think it's 14 managers during his tenure. Some some astronomical number like that. Sure. He has he hasn't exhibited the patience to and to to want to get someone in there like a Hassan Hutel who has a philosophy to give him the patient to give whomever the patience to implement their philosophy and have it be something that's there for long term. It's always been about results and bringing in the high priced talent. And the point about Brendan Rodgers for me where we're discussing Lester is, say, number seven of the big six, where you have an ownership group that, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but King Power for me as an ownership group has always been fairly hands-off and letting managers do whatever they want when they come in. Do you, if you're Brendan Rogers, want to deal with, a King Power ownership group as the number seven trying to get into the big six? Or do you want to go into Chelsea where you have an owner who has an exhibited patience with managers? There's that constant churn. You're bringing in the high price talent. For me, do you want to be seven working into the big six or do you want to get into the big six? That would be my question, especially with what's above you and all of the, the constant talk that comes from Abramovich and what he wants for results. It's easy to say that what Chelsea's done, you know, if, if we're looking at it from not leaving a style, from not developing a style as a negative, but look, I mean, when Abramovich took over, they had one Premier League title to their name. They've got six now. You know, they had two second division titles at that stage and one first division league title, three league titles in total, two of them in the lower tier. Now you added five more Premier League titles. You add three FA Cups. Now you've added five more. Yeah. You know you've added three League Cups. You already had two. Um, you've got a Champions League now. You've got two Europa Leagues. You know you've got things that you never had. So I get it. And, and if that's who you are, if you are, you know the the plaything of a very expensive owner, a very rich owner who likes to go sign the best players and bring them in and win trophies, then that's, that's who you are. And that's, that's worked for Real Madrid for a long time. It, it yeah. can work. Is there a middle ground? I don't know. You know, maybe a Brendan Rogers would be that middle ground because he's a, a progressive manager, but he's not truly rigid in terms of the way his teams play. I mean, they have principles, but you know, it's not like Hassan Hutel. Um, he could adapt. You know, as somebody like Carlo Ancelotti was the perfect person for, for Chelsea because he's a bit of a chameleon in terms of his tactics. He can adjust based off what he has. He, he's not really married to one scheme. You know, he can kind of figure it out with what he's got to work with. I'll be curious to see what they do. Um, just the, the appointment of Lampard to begin with was a different kind of situation. That, look, they turned away from when they had Di Matteo. You know, I mean, Di Matteo, like, took over midseason and ended up winning the Champions League, and he didn't get a long period there. You know, they didn't really give him the opportunity. He's a former player, not a legend like Lampard, but he didn't get that opportunity. They went for the bigger names. 
maybe things changed from when they hired Lampard. You know, remember they had the transfer ban. Lampard was going to have that year where he couldn't go into the market. Um, thought it was going to be longer. Ended up being shorter. He did well in year one because of that limitation. Now it's a different expectation. And are we back to the old school Chelsea where it's all right, winner else? Yeah. And, and and we'll see. You know, does that change because it's Lampard? It, it's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out. We'll just have to see how it plays out. But the names are circling around Chelsea, and they're going to continue to. And that game with Leicester coming up in the middle of the month really feels like a, a showdown kind of game for Frank Lampard and Chelsea and what the future will hold. And Brendan Rodgers might be part of that future if, if yeah. these rumors are true, and that could get really, really interesting. Uh, we got to talk about yesterday, Liverpool losing. Talked about it a little bit on soccer over there. Uh, Ragamuffin, you might want to cover your ears. Um, <laughs> it's not a good stretch for Liverpool right now, and, and we've talked about it. The possession is great. The um, shots are not great at the moment in terms of being on goal. Uh, there's just not many clear-cut chances at the moment. It is an issue. Uh, Jurgen Klopp, we played the clip where he, he brought up Manchester United's penalty earning success, which this year is not as big of a deal. Last year it was. Last season it was. Um, Klopp said that his side were denied a clear penalty and, and said that he probably should have got a second one too. Um, said the handball was a clear penalty. Turned to the fourth official and he said, we checked already, no penalty. And he said, what Andre Mariner, the referee, did with Sadio Mane tonight, I'm not sure that's okay to be honest. Mane went down under a challenge from Kyle Walker-Peters. And then that's when Klopp said, I hear now that Manchester United had more penalties in two years than I had in five and a half years. I have no idea if that's my fault or how that can happen. They just so happened to play in a couple weeks. You know, not an accident that was brought up. No. Um, and at the end of all that, he said, but it's no excuse for the performance. We cannot change it. We have to respect the decisions. But we can change our performance. That's our focus now. And it has to. They have to change the performance because it hasn't been good enough lately. Teams have not figured it out because that's a really, I think, simplified way of putting this stuff. Teams are playing Liverpool from a very conservative position at the moment because of who they're playing, too. I mean, let's, right. let's be real. You know, if you're playing Manchester City, they're not going to approach you conservatively. If you're playing Leeds, they're not going to approach you conservatively. Others will. And the last three opponents, I mean, it's two very conservative ones in West Brom and Newcastle, and not as conservative of one in Southampton. But, yeah, I mean, Hassan is going to be a defense-first approach in that. He's not going to, you know, get, he's not going to be crazy there because he understands what Klopp's team does. So will that change when they play Manchester United? How conservative would Ole Gunnar Solskjaer be in that one going to Anfield? Don't know. Um, if he's in first place in the league, it could be a little bit different conversation. And he could be because Manchester United plays Burnley a few days before that one. The race is going to be fun. Are you worried about Liverpool right now? Am I worried about Liverpool right now? I uh, want two points in three games. Are, are you yeah. worried about Liverpool right now? Two wins in their last six. 45 shots, seven on target in the last three matches. The injuries at the back, and that for me, I know that a lot of folks uh, pick a pundit overseas and they're saying, well, they need to get somebody. No, they don't need to get anybody. Yeah, they do. No, they don't. And so you get all those opinions. Am I worried? I think that I look at festive fixtures and I kind of take it at, at face value that you're going to have odd results. And I think that by the end of festive fixtures, you get that stuff out of the way, then you can get settled and get toward the, the remainder of the season. I'm not as concerned about Liverpool, I think, as a lot of other folks. And I know that Nathan Pugh's probably, you know, jumping up and down and clapping about it. I just think that talent will win out overall as you get toward the, the tail end of the year. I don't think I'm as concerned about other folks. With everything that's going on, I look and like I said, I take festive fixtures in its own little thing and put it to the side sometimes because you're going to get results that are atypical. So I don't think I'm as concerned as other folks are. I'm concerned, but for different reasons than the ones you brought up. Um, I'm concerned because they've had two years where they've been incredible. 
and can yes. I do that for a third? Um, that's really tough. It's really difficult. Is the is the is the intensity there? Is the want to there in the same way? They won the league last year, which they wanted to do for so long. They've got a Champions League the year before that. Do they have the the fight to battle out of this right now? That, it's a question, and I want to see how they respond in that game against Manchester United. Honestly, I want to see how they respond against Aston Villa in FA Cup this weekend. Because yeah. if that d- goes poorly, then this could get really weird. Yeah. Um, I'm not worried about the defense, even though they are missing a bunch of people, because they haven't been giving up goals. They haven't been giving up a bunch. I mean, in the last six where they've only got two wins, one goal to Fulham, one goal to Tottenham, none to Crystal Palace, one to West Brom, one to Southampton, four goals in six games. It's nothing to worry about. Yeah. Um, when you start playing better competition, yes, it'll come up, but you're not going to go out and spend big money anyway. It's not going to happen. If you go out and get Sven Botman from... The Netherlands, if you go and get somebody else of that ilk, okay, it'll help. Um, but you're not going to go get a, a David Oliver right now. It's not happening. So the defense is okay. They are creating chances, which is one of the number one things. The quality of the chances is a little bit of a question. That's what we need to see change for, for Liverpool. I do, when I hear all the comments from Klopp, and I know the people who have followed him for a long time say that this is, this is who he is, this is what happens when the pressure gets uh, you know, higher, this is what happens. It feels a little different than it's been during his time at Liverpool. They're in a different situation. They are the hunted now, and everybody's gunning for them. And teams will be even more negative against them and, and make them break them down and take away Liverpool's ability in transition as much. So it's going to be interesting to see how they adjust. Klopp is a great manager, and Klopp's adjustments in England have been incredibly impressive to have to deal with these things. He's got another one to make, and we'll see what the drive of this team is. Because when you get a couple of titles in a row, and we saw it with Manchester City last year, and they had a good year, but everybody questioned, like, how do they have that killer instinct? They'd had two of the best seasons in Premier League history in the previous two. Yes, they still had Champions League out there that they wanted, but, I mean, how much more can you do when you're getting 100 points a year? Right. You know, like, Liverpool's in that same situation. Things have have spun a little bit. Can they right the ship, or are guys kind of, you know, fat and happy, as people will say? We'll see. It's going to be really, really interesting to see. Uh, Ragamuffin with a couple of things, and and good point on Diego Jota. Him being out has been a, a huge effect on the attack. Yeah. Uh, Klopp's dabbled with a 4-2-3-1 at times. Without him, the 4-3-3 isn't working because the main six, and yesterday uh, Jordan Henderson was in the back. He's at center back. Your outside backs aren't as effective in that situation. It shows how one player moving or not being available can make everything else kind of fall apart a little bit. Uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold had a horrible day yesterday, a ton of giveaways. That's going to happen sometimes. Um, Ragamuffin says the midfield is a dog right now that cannot transition to the front. (laughs) And once they do, the front three can't do anything with it. So you're getting some breakdowns. Okay, those are all fixable. Those are all things that can be sorted out. Let's see how Klopp handles it. His comments are the thing that worry me the most because I wonder how he is handling it. Yeah. He should. He should be fine. He has been in these kinds of situations before, except he's never really been exactly in this situation where he's not Dortmund fighting against the big power of Bayern Munich. He's not, when he got to Liverpool, fighting to get them back to the top. He's not what he was a couple years ago, fighting with Pep to win the league. Now he's got a league title. Now he's got a Champions League. Now everybody's gunning for him. Can he handle that reverse? We'll see. Uh, He should, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Nathan Pugh on the Twitter side. Top of the league with most goals scored, but looked like hot cat crap the last month. That's gross. Palace notwithstanding. Devoid of ideas of what to do in the 18 and bottling any luck they find on the pitch. Crap third, third kid that. Up the profligate Reds, exclamation point. Plucky upstarts. Uh, burned on Tuchel about style. Um, just the idea of like how rigid is he to that, and, and would he fit it at Chelsea? Uh, Burn said it's not really a good answer to it. He followed Klopp at, at Mines and Dortmund and sort of continued in that style. 
uh, didn't watch much of PSG, didn't see anything special or progressive when I did, and, and I was kind of the same way watching it from Champions League stuff. Yeah, he selects the right players, gives a team structure and organization, but I don't think he has a very marked playing philosophy. I would, I would tend to agree, but I wonder if he adjusted it to PSG and what he had. And that would be interesting to see if he would take more of what he did at PSG, which was maybe a little more vanilla, with a, a philosophy, but you know, kind of open for the individuals to be individual moments FC, the latest insult for people. <laughs> yeah, so stupid. Um, or would he be a little bit more uh, of a structured manager because he would think maybe he's got the players to do that? Be curious to see. Um, I don't know. I don't. Re- yeah, I don't really know either how he how he would go at Chelsea. I think he'd be a. If we're comparing just him and Hasenhutl, I think he'd be an easier fit for Chelsea because he he's more malleable. He's more you know adaptable to what he has. And I think that's what they want. But you always get Abramovich saying, "I want a style. I want a style. I want I want people to know what Chelsea looks like." Well, I mean, if you want that, then you want to you want to get Hasenhutl. And you've got to convince him to do it, and he's got to be convinced that he's going to have the time to do it. Yeah. And that's not going to be easy to do. Um, as, as Ragamuffin points out, and it's a, it's a good one, after the Villa game, and the Villa game is on the 8th in FA Cup, Liverpool's got till the 17th to work at the training ground, get things right, heading, in, heading into the Manchester United showdown. Manchester United has a very busy schedule between uh, now and then, and that's going to help Liverpool a little bit going into that. Manchester United has Gummy Bear Cup tomorrow against Manchester City. That's at Old Trafford. We'll talk about that here in a minute. On the 9th, they host Watford in FA Cup. Then they go to Burnley on the 12th. Then they go to Liverpool on the 17th. They're not going to come in quite as fresh. Liverpool should be able to take advantage of that. We will see if they do so. Let's get into that Gummy Bear Cup um, on the Manchester United, Manchester City style. Manchester United, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. His teams have lost four semifinals in the last 12 months. Can they figure out how to win a semifinal? They need to learn how to do it. Um, Ole said there's no excuses if they don't do it. I mean, this is a game they, they have to start winning. It's just flat out. They have to start winning these games. It's a rematch of last year's Gummy Bear Cup semi. Uh, Manchester United comes in winning eight out of their last ten in the Premier League. They go top of the table if they don't lose at Burnley on the 12th. When they last met, scoreless draw at Old Trafford. It was pretty bleh. Now, Ole versus Guardiola. I was a little blown away by this. Last six encounters. Ole's got three wins. Pep's got two. The other one is that blah draw. Has, has Ole figured Pep out? <laughs> has he figured him out? Does he have the, the key to unlock Guardiola's style? I just like doing that voice. I don't even know why anymore. That hurt. That sounded like it hurt. Nah, my voice is so messed up right now. I'm not feeling a thing. Oh, wow. That, that was good, though. I'll give you credit. Has he unlo- well, here's, here's your early juice boxes, by the way. Yeah, what are they? Manchester City, even money, plus 100. Okay. Manchester United, plus 260. Your draws mm-hmm. are plus 280. Not going to lie, I kind of like that plus 260. Uh-huh. Kind of intrigued by that plus 260. Mm-hmm. That's pretty high for a team playing as well as Manchester United is. Yep. Manchester City's playing very, very well, too. Uh, there, there's no way around that either, and don't. Don't get it twisted. While Manchester United comes in winning 8 of 10 in the league, Manchester City, who across all competitions, win, 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 draw, draw, win. And then we go back, win, draw, win, win, loss against Tottenham on November 21st. Pretty good. So that one loss in their last 10 or 11? Uh, well, you go back before the Tottenham loss and then draw, win, 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 draw. And this is in all competitions. <laughs> win, win, draw, win. The other loss, you have to go all the way back to September 27th against Leicester, the 5-2 loss. So wow. two losses since September 27th Wow, for Manchester City. 
and, and no Sam Williamson. I am not Batman. Christian Bale version. Maybe. Um, the, uh... Go ahead. Uh, I, was, I was trying to figure out who it was, uh, the, the Lego Batman. Who's, uh, uh, who's, well, Will Arnett, that's what I was trying to think of. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, as, as Tesco points out, City isn't giving up many goals this season. Manchester United is, and Manchester City's not scoring quite as many goals as Manchester United has been. Um, but, of course, they're all from penalties, according to Jurgen Klopp. So, you know, there you right. go. I want to see what approach Ole comes out with. You know, let's go back to that last league game real quick, just for a glimpse. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. So that match, you saw Marcus Rashford start up top, which he hasn't been lately. It's been Martial. Um, you saw a 4-2-3-1, according to SofaScore, with uh, Fred and McTominay behind a, a three of Pogba on the left, Bruno Fernandes on the, in the middle, and Mason Greenwood on the right. Now, something that came up in that last match was Pogba playing on the left again, and we've seen a little bit more of this in a very free role. I think it can work if you have that midfield base, but for me, everything comes down to as much as you want to get Pogba free, I think you, you want to get Bruno Fernandes free. He's, he's the guy. I mean, he's been incredible since he came to Manchester United. And you can, you've been able to deal without having an elite bit of production up top. You know, I mean, most of the teams that we're talking about at the top of the table have an elite goal scorer. Martial hasn't been that. Rashford, I don't think, is that. I think Rashford is more of a winger. Uh, Greenwood hasn't been that, you know, Bruno scored a ton of goals, but he's also created a ton. Pogba is not an elite goal scorer, but because of how good Fernandes has been, you're able to bridge that a little bit. Uh, this game does count as part of Cavani's, uh, suspension, which is stupid. And the, everybody in South America has railed all over this thing and the FA doesn't seem to get it. Um, I want to see how they how he, he structures it. So he went four two three one against City in that scoreless draw. City went four two three one. Does City do the Kevin De Bruyne false nine deal again that worked so well over the weekend against Chelsea? And then how would Ole handle that? It's going to be fun to see what the tactics look like because they've played so much lately, and Ole's had a little bit of the upper hand. Does Pep throw a surprise at him? Pep's known to do that, so could be a fun one to watch from a tactical perspective tomorrow. Yeah, Fabrizio Romano uh, is hanging out with Sky this month for transfers. You mentioned Pogba. Romano thinks that Pogba's staying. He says, uh, talking to people In January, yeah. I mean, Mariola basically said that he wasn't going anywhere in January. Yeah, Romano says, it's really complicated for Juventus to spend 100 million euro on a player, and it's the same for Real Madrid, who isn't signing anybody in January, and he doesn't expect PSG to bid for Pogba right now. He's uh, from Romano. Pogba is respecting Manchester United and also the manager staying until the summer, and then you'll have Paul Pogba on the market. Yeah, that's another thing that, you know, for all the people who, who crack on Ole, and, man, I just got, like, five different uh, remember-to-go-vote texts at all at the same time. This is getting ridiculous. Remember-to-go-vote. Cannot wait till this is over with. Um, and, yes, go vote today, but... I cannot wait till I stop getting texts and calls nonstop. How much stuff do you get in the mail on a daily basis? You don't even want to know. No, I, well, I wanted to know if your stack was as thick as mine. I, I hope yours is not as much as I've been getting. It, it's absurd. Yeah. Um, for all the, the stick that Ole gets and all the time that you need to, to get rid of him, the Paul Pogba situation. I think a lot of different managers, a lot of different situations like this would fall apart and the team would fall apart. Pogba's playing hard for Ole. Mm-hmm. You know, Pogba might want to leave. You know, Raiola might want him to leave to make a bunch of money. I, I, there's all kinds of things to it. But he's playing for Ole. And I think he has a lot of respect for Ole. And you've got to give Ole credit for navigating that and not letting it be a distraction. Because I thought it would be. I, I said before the season, I was like, you need to move Pogba because it's going to become a problem. It hasn't been. That's a credit to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And I think he's a good manager with the group. Now, he's in that same boat you know, that we've talked about with managers that, you know, what is the identifiable style? I don't know if there really truly is one just yet. 
with Ole. We've seen some little things here and there, but is, is there something that you know you hang your hat on when you watch his team play? Not yet, but the difference between him and Lampard at Chelsea is his teams look organized. Yeah, you know, maybe it's simple. Maybe it is playing for individual moments, FC. But they're structured and they're not giving up bad goals. You know, Chelsea's giving up bad goals. They don't look structured. There's, that's a huge difference. Yeah. And if you're going to be you know, managing individual moments FC, you've got to have a structure so you don't give up bad goals so you wash away the individual moments. And I think Ole's done that so far. Uh, we shall see. Uh, the other game in the Gummy Bear Cup semifinal today, Tottenham hosting Brentford. Yeah, the, gum, the, the numbers are pretty large, huh? Minus 222 for Tottenham. Brentford is a plus 630, and your draw is a plus 360. So if you have not been following Brentford in the championship, uh, they are playing really well. They uh, have not played since December 30th, so they will come in fresh. They did not play against Bristol City on the 2nd. That was postponed. They won at Born or they won against Bournemouth. They won at Cardiff City. They beat Newcastle in the Gummy Bear Cup. Um, yeah, it's Newcastle. Uh, sorry, Alex Pacino. I apologize. Uh, they beat Reading three one. They drew. They won. They drew. I mean, you're going back. You're going back to October twenty fourth for their last loss against Stoke City on the road. They're playing very well. Do you think Jose Mourinho goes first, first choice today? Uh, well, I, I think so, because you, you want to get into the I think final. he needs to. If he yeah. doesn't, I think he's opening up the door to get upset. Yeah. Uh, news from the uh, Daily Mail. Tottenham is fining Sergio Reguilon, Eric Lamella, and Giovanni Lo Celso for breaching COVID restric- restrictions, not suspending them after they broke Tier 4 rules with Manuel Lanzini of West Ham by spending Christmas together. He, so uh, they're suspended, or they're fined, but not suspended. That's according to The Athletic. Hmm. To, add, to add to all of this. wonder if they would have been suspended in other situations. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Lomilla tweeted over the weekend, I want to apologize for a decision I made over Christmas, which I deeply regret. Uh, La Celso, and he continued for another couple of sentences. La Celso responded to fans' criticisms by posting, I want to apologize to everyone. I understand the great sacrifices people are making to keep themselves and loved ones safe, and the frustration you've expressed toward me is justified, end quote. And uh, Lanzini posted on Twitter, starting with four prayer emojis, uh, praying emojis, and he apologized as well. Yeah, I, I mean, just talking about the lineup today, Ragamuffin, I think, has the, the point here of how this is going to play out. He's got to go first choice today because it's a semifinal, and and if he doesn't, he, he's running a risk against a, a lower division team that is playing well and has knocked right. off some Premier League competition. Yeah. And then he's got who are they playing in the FA Cup? Marine FC. Yeah, Marine FC. Yeah. Who is this? Uh, non-league. Um, wow, I, I want to. Let me see how many layers below uh, they are here. So. Yeah, and I think I think it was a Jamie Carricker is sponsoring Marine FC in that match. Yeah, because they were going to be able, you know, obviously in the situation, they would be ecstatic because they're hosting Tottenham in an FA Cup game. You'd pack your stadium out. You'd make a ton of money that might fund your season. Well, you're not right now. And, and Jamie Carragher sponsored the match. Um, very, very cool. And, and that's awesome that Carragher, <laughs> Carragher does some stuff in some of his commentary that I'm like, really, dude? But he does a lot of really good things, too. Um, he, he seems like a pretty good guy. A little, little boisterous at times, but a good guy. Eighth, eighth tier Marine from the wow. Northern Premier League Division I Northwest will be the biggest underdogs in the competition history when they welcome Tottenham to Rosset Park on Sunday. They are plus 3,300 <laughs> uh, at the one I'm seeing here. They beat uh, Haven't and Waterlooville 1 0. Yes. November twenty ninth after one took extra a while time because you yeah. can't you can't underestimate have it in Waterlooville. That was you a, never and I will can. say this the the optics for that match were fantastic because they didn't have any they couldn't have any fans inside the ground, so you had folks whose homes were right up against the fence, basically sipping champagne, looking through their fence lines in their backyards, watching the match. 
Jeez. Amazing visuals. It's great. Oh, man. Craziness with the FA Cup. <laughs> um, yeah, Tottenham's got to rest people for that one. You've got to go for it today and rest people for that one. So they are based in Crosby, Merseyside. They were founded in 1894. Um, the Lily Whites or the Mariners, which would make a lot of sense. Madness. And they're sixth in the eighth tier. Well, they're not last. No, they're not. <laughs> oh, man. But now the visuals there for last time out were fantastic. I can't wait to see what this one looks like. Yeah, it should be fun. Um, <laughs> Alex Bassine says, you don't have to apologize every time you mention Newcastle. But also, why? <laughs> that's, 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 that's why I apologize, Alex. I, I feel bad. Um, <laughs> when Mickey suffers, we all suffer, Mata Flo says. Yeah, yeah, one day, one day. Either he'll be gone or something. Yeah. Uh, Nick Alifi is a Marine FC uh, fan for life now. And Mizano's all on board, too, so we have a Marine FC supporters group in the Twitch pitch. Oh, that's great. Dr. D's joined them already. Everybody's rooting against Jose Mourinho and, and, and Tottenham in this one. Sorry, Tottenham fans. Everybody's against you with Marine FC. I think oh, you'll be okay. I think you'll be okay. Yeah, they're only a plus 3,300. I would have thought it would have been more. Uh, give it time. It, it's, it's Tuesday. The game is on the 9th, right? Yeah. Yeah, give it time. I think they'll be okay. Um, it probably will go up to four, I would think, because I can't imagine there's going to be much money there. No. I can't imagine many people are going to pick this one to even go. It's not going to go to a replay, right? There's no replays in the FA Cup now. It's, you go, do you go straight to penalties or do you go to extra time? It was uh, extra time because the, the match with Havitt and Waterlooville went through extra okay. time and then into penalties. So you're going to extra time, then penalties. You're not going to a replay situation. Uh, they are not going to have the concussion substitute added for the FA Cup because of paperwork. They couldn't get it done in time is what I remember reading. Yeah. Uh, in the Carabao Cup today and tomorrow, they will be able to make the five substitutions, right? Yeah. Okay. So they'll be able to have nine players on the sub bench, five substitutions in the semifinals of the Gummy Bear Cup, Tottenham, Brentford, Manchester United, Manchester City. Three subs in FA Cup, right? Uh, sound, yeah, that sounds right. You don't sound too sure. Uh, that sounds good, but I'm going to double check. <laughs> you double check on that one, please. Um, because I, I'm confused trying to keep up with all of England's crazy rules since they're the only ones who didn't want to have five subs in league play. It's, it's very confusing. Um, we'll, we'll see about that as John is pounding on his uh, old school keyboard that's wireless, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You find it? Yeah. Anything? Got it? Come on. No? No. The research department is, is a little slow today. Five substitutes FA Cup. Five substitutes in the FA Cup. There we go. So uh, Marine FC can can bring everybody off the bench. And they'll be in good Hop shape. Hop the fence. Hey, sure. you want to play? Come on in. Sure. Why not? While we're talking about the, the smaller teams, uh, some bits of news around the EFL, which Marine FC is not quite in the EFL. Uh, Oxford United suspended a couple of youth team players. They broke COVID-19 rules to attend a New Year's party. Uh, Carl Robinson said that some clubs may be getting a little sloppy with enforcing regulations, like his. Um, a U21 and a U18 player, they could become the first British professional footballers to be sacked for breaching rules brought in to stop the spread of the virus. Um, Rockdale. League One, third division. Their chief executive, David Bottomley, said that the EFL will be forced to halt matches temporarily due to the surge in COVID cases. More than 50 matches called off this season in the EFL. Bottomley says that the EFL must take action. Um, 34 League One matches have been called off so far. Rockdale's previous two have been called off. And he he said that they could stop for a month um, while the vaccines are getting rolled out and then be okay with coming back. I mean, I don't know if anybody truly knows that yet. I, I do believe the vaccine rollout is going a little bit more smoothly in the UK than it is here, so maybe that's more feasible. I also think that if the EFL has to do it, they could because you're not as concerned with players missing 
games at the end of the season if you have to extend it because of the Euros, because of the Copa America, the, the Gold Cup, all the international competition. They can play through that if they have to in, in the EFL. Now, maybe the second division, the championship, would struggle with that. But the third and the fourth division, if that's what you got to do, I think that's what you have to do. And if they have to separate that way and, and do their schedule in that manner, I, I think they have to consider it at this point. Um, right now, it's just you've got a bunch of games you have to make up. And if you have to make them up at the end, you make them up at the end. Uh, Wigan. We thought the deal was done. Everybody thought the deal was done for Felipe Moreno, the owner of Leganes, to take over at Wigan. It's not, and it's ended. It's not happening now at all. Uh, the bid had been reduced by almost 50% over the weekend. If they had proceeded with it, it would have resulted in a 15-point deduction for the club because of their financial situation. They wouldn't have been able to pay off the debts. They're currently 22nd in the League 1 table right now, two points adrift of safety. Moreno had initially been part of a, a group that was going to buy it. One of the group was subject to a disqualifying condition. Then Moreno became the sole bidder, and then he slashed the actual bid over the weekend. They've been in administration since July of 2020. I don't know what their plans are now. I don't know what they, if they have plans. I don't know what it looks like for Wigan at the moment. It's, it's not good. No. Nope. And they... You know, they're right there when it comes to getting out of the relegation zone, taking taking the financial situation and putting it to the side for a second. They're right there. There's a group of folks that are within three to five points of either safety or relegation. They're right there on goal difference in the relegation zone. So, I mean, and they've had a decent run of form. I mean, they've only lost once in their last five, and then you get this news. And so... Uh, not looking good for Wigan, and it's really disappointing. A couple other updates. I uh, mentioned that a lot of players and teams and the, the Uruguayan Players Association uh, ripped the FA for their decision to suspend Edison Cavani. Uh, Conmebol has now expressed um, their issues with the sanction, and that's that's even bigger. So keep an eye on him. He's already missed one game. I don't know if they're going to you know, make any quick changes or not. I don't know where this stands, but um, they're getting blasted for it everywhere. Uh, we'll talk about Copa Libertadores in an hour two because you have the first leg of the semifinal tonight with River and Palmeiras. Um, on the coaching front down there, the Chile job is still appearing to be up in the air, and a name that I did not expect to be in the mix for Chile. Now, remember, the Chilean manager, Reynaldo Rueda, is going to Colombia. The escape clause that Colombia needed to pay at one point was a million dollars. Now it's sounding like 500000 That should all be done. So now you've got to replace him in Chile. Gabriel Heinze's name had come up before he took the Atlanta job. Uh, Hernan Crespo's name has come up. Ariel Holland's name has come up. Previously managed Independiente in Argentina, managed Ezequiel Barco. Now, according to reports in Italy, Luciano Spalletti has turned down an offer from the Chilean Federation and will not accept a new job before his contract with Inter expires in June. He was reported to be in talks to replace Rueda, go to Chile. He's turned down the offer. He wants to see his contract out with Inter because he's making $5 million a year. It expires in June. He wants to get every single check he can possibly get from Inter. He doesn't want to take another job until that's done. Uh, they fired him to hire Antonio Conte at, at Inter, and he felt betrayed. So he's going to get every dollar, every lira he can from Inter. So he's not going to take the Chile job. Uh, not South America, but Mexico... We talked about Hugo Sanchez taking over at Cruz Azul. Something changed at the very last minute on this thing. And Hugo Sanchez is not the manager at Cruz Azul. It is Juan Reynoso, who managed Puebla last season. He was part of the Cruz Azul squad that won the league in 1997 as a player. Had a lot of success as a player in Mexico. And now he takes over at Cruz Azul. Hugo Sanchez is back to doing TV, I guess. Don't know if it was on Hugo's side. There were some reports saying that it was. He wanted more money at the last minute. There are some other reports saying that they, they cut the budget for the coaching staff, and that was his issue. Don't know. 
but Reynoso is in place at Cruz Azul, not Hugo Sanchez. And the Clausura starts this weekend, starts on the 8th for uh, the Guardianes 2021. And so let's see. Uh, every the, There are only two favorites right now, two distinct favorites right now in matches this weekend for round one of the Clausura. It is Club America going up against Atletico San Luis, no surprise. And Pachuca is a favorite against Juarez once again, no surprise. Who? Everybody else is looking like a draw, basically, in juice box. Basically, that's what you're saying? Yeah. Hmm. Everybody's, everybody's on the plus side, and there's only those two distinct favorites, except for maybe Tigres against Leon. Tigres is at a plus 112, and Toluca is a favorite. But everybody looks like it's a draw, pretty much. Very, very interesting. Okay, let's get into it. Everybody get your uh, scorecards out. It, it's that time. Oh, okay, yes. cool. Yes, it's that time. It is time for John, as he stretches to get ready for this, yep, to, ready. to tell us about our, our good friend, Steve Apolinski in Decatur, GA. Apolinski and Associates, LLC, proud supporters of everything soccer down here in the SDH Network for wrongful death and serious injury and num- uh, matters, numbers, getting into numbers in just a second. That's a good way to start this promo read. Uh, one place that you need to go, it's Apolinski and Associates, LLC. A couple of different ways for wrongful death and serious injury matters that you can have conversations and get your questions answered. You can go on the telephone. Big telephone, landline, cell, doesn't matter, whatever you have these days. 404-377-9191. Get a free consultation that way. You can shoot Steve an email directly, steve at aa-legal.com. Or you can go on the World Wide Web in, the task, in that uh, taskbar deal. You can type aa-legal.com, large device or small, enter, return, arrow, whatever advances it forward. The homepage is there for you at aa-legal.com. A pop-up window pops up low right-hand corner because that's what pop-up windows do. They pop up 24-7, 365 and a quarter. Thank you, Chris Hutchison, for that number as always. And you can, we don't, we still don't know who is there. We still do not know who's on the other end of that pop-up window to have your questions answered, but you can have them answered that way as well. Recognized as Legal Elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the top 100 firms in the state of Georgia. Wrongful death and serious injury matters in Georgia and Alabama. Over 30 years of experience, over $40 million in judgments for their clients. There's only one place that you need to go to get your questions answered for matters like these. Appalinsky and Associates, LLC, proud supporter of everything soccer down here in the SDH Network. The website is aa-legal. There it is. Dot com. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Oh boy, I don't really have any words for that. Uh, that was it was all over the place. That was the longest one we've ever. It seen. It was. Yes. It didn't seem like it. It was. Um, wow, that was that was something. Um, That's a word to use. The the, the playback from the judging committee here uh, stumbles out of the blocks. Oh yeah, like I said, that was a, that was not the good way to start. Red card in the first minute. Okay. Uh, I like the finger swing from uh, from Martha. But that's what I always do to accent the note at the end of the read. You gave up a hit to the leadoff hitter. It's accurate. Don't talk. So basically, to- I was Tom Glavin in this promo read, is what you're saying. You were nowhere near Tom Glavin, sir. You get uh, to Tom Glavin, you no, got to get him early. No, you were you were nowhere near that. You were Zane Smith. Uh, don't talk oh, about oh, how wow. the sausage is made. Uh, self-derailed 5.5, 5. Uh, minus one too fast, minus one stumbled out of the gate, minus one telephone question mark, minus one task bar deal, going to go with a solid 3.7. Uh, solid five, broke the fourth wall immediately, lost in who's on the other side of the pop-up window, bad timing, four out of ten. Uh-huh. Another four, couldn't recover from the early issues. I'm not going to give a grade. I'm just going to say yikes. That's about how I felt. <laughs> Who gave us that one? That was Ricky. <laughs> Boy, Ricky. Uh, you faulted. You're disqualified. Strummer John. Wow. Um, we all get nervous sometimes, Cassie says, which is true. I wasn't nervous. It was just... I, what The way that it traditionally will happen with me is uh, I'll have about nine different directions in my head and... Then the car crashes, and then you get what happened today. Uh, Nick Alifi, Soviet Union score, 3.5. Thank you, Russian judge. 
Uh, Mizano says, if you're comparing yourself to pitchers, you are the best Atlanta has to offer. Luke Jackson. Um, w. Secor. I think that's a new one. Uh, compared you to Fulty. Stumbled out of the gate and got worse. That's okay. about right. Hacho missed the dismount, 4.5. Uh, well, Turner, I, you know, if that was the case, then it would have been like the the one blooper reel where you see the the collegiate gymnast on the uh, pommel horse and he slips off the off of the uh, the ramp and he just goes directly into the pommel horse itself, mm-hmm. and just slams right into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, because you kept going, so that, that wouldn't be accurate. Um, let's see. Turner says, "Don't you get three faults?" He did. I think he might have hit all three. Turner actually. Uh, so. And and Burns said you imitated the Hawks last night, which is about yeah. accurate. But you started bad too, so that might be even different. True. I am, and, and you got a two point five for the gymnastics explanation as well. Um, I'm gonna say what it reminded me of, since this is a soccer show, and if you have not seen this clip, you need to go watch it. Uh, Claudio Canizia in the opening game from the 1990 World Cup against Cameroon, where he he's taking off on a run. Cameroon's already down to ten players at this point. And he gets hit at like midfield, and he's stumbling, and he's, got, he's swinging his arms trying to get his balance, and he kind of gets his balance back, and he touches the ball past the defender, he gets hit again, and he's really flailing, his arms are looking like windmills, and he can't quite get his balance back, and then Benjamin Massing just comes in and levels him with one of the greatest fouls of all time, so hard <laughs> that Massing lost his shoe. And if you go back and watch this clip, first off, like, John was Claudio Canizia in this, by the way. Okay. Um, Watch the clip for one very important little thing. When Massing hits him and Massing's shoe goes flying off, the Argentine players who come over to get in his face and argue with him because he just nearly impaled one of their top players, they all are very, very, very intentional in trying to step on Massing's foot. Like, very intentional trying to stomp on his foot without a shoe on it. They don't miss anything. <laughs> they mm-hmm. were definitely mm-hmm. going to get him. Uh, Nick said that was like Titus O'Neil trying to get to the ring in the Royal Rumble, and that, that yeah, is, that is that'd accurate. be about right. That that, is that, that right. one, that one, I definitely can uh, can agree with here. That's uh, as I said, okay. So here's the play. Here's I'm watching Kinesia and Massing. You're going to give the play. Up. No, Massing's the last one. There's plenty of other people. You get a whack at Kinesia first. Okay, there's two. He stumbles. There's three. Finally, off his off his pins, shoes off. It's the couple of Argentines who come over and try to stomp on Massing's foot. That, that put me over the edge. I was yeah. laughing hysterically. That was, yeah, that was your first uh, attempted stomp as he's now putting his shoe back on. And, okay, yeah. All right, so I'm right there with you. Okay, now I see what you're talking about. I have the reference. <laughs> a longer clip um moises caicedo is a player we've talked about quite a bit around here everybody has thought that manchester united was going to get moises caicedo first for like four million dollars then it got up to like five or six he's a, a regular for ecuador's national team now as a teenager he was a regular in the copa libertadores he has emerged as an incredible talent um Sounds a little bit like the Ezekiel Barco situation where maybe there was some form of an agreement not as strong as Atlanta had with Independiente at that time. And then the club's like, yeah, the situation's changed a little bit. We're going to need more money. So now we're at a point with Caicedo that it really depends on who you talk to. And this is where it gets very tricky for European-based journalists because you're getting comments out of South America and journalists there that are very different than what Fabrizio Romano and others are saying. The last thing we heard from Romano on Caicedo was that Manchester United had everything locked in. They just needed to pull the trigger. It's done. Santiago Morales, he's the the GM or technical director at Independiente del Valle, Caicedo's club. He gave an interview yesterday. I believe the interview was given to El Canal de Fútbol in Ecuador said that they hope to have the deal for Caicedo done by Thursday. He said it was not Manchester United, and I've not seen that really cross over into much of the English language media. He said it was down to a European team and an MLS team. 
I don't know who the MLS team is. I have been uh, digging. I have been campaigning for Moises Caicedo for months and months and months, thanks to uh, Mataflo and others, you know, pumping him up. And I'm completely bought into the hype and said, you know, MLS and Atlanta need to jump in and get Moises Caicedo if you can. Sounded like it wasn't ever going to be possible. Maybe that door's open back up. Maybe things have gotten crazy. It's very, very interesting. Uh, Morales said, we have not received any firm proposal from Manchester United for the player, Moises Caicedo. Now, who is the European club, or are there multiple ones? Because, I mean, you just start kind of scrolling through to find who it could be. I have seen Burnley as a possibility there, and I don't know if Burnley is going to be able to come up with $10 bucks to get this done. That's what it's sounding like. Is it going to be at new least 10? make a splash, maybe? Maybe, and that's true. They would have new ownership to possibly do it. Um, Everton's name has come up from different sources, and, and these are all like, you know, you're, you're kind of trying to get who the good source is. Chelsea's name has come up as well. Um, I have my South American list on, on Twitter, and I'm kind of going through and seeing what they're saying about it. Uh, Chelsea's name came up on the the European side of it, I'm seeing Burnley and Everton come up from South American journalists. Um, MLS, though. That's the one. He's 19. Um, he's an incredible young talent. He's an incredible young talent. People who follow the South American you know, up-and-coming stars are all kind of blown away by this guy. By the way, he's a six. By the way, that's a position Atlanta United could use. If they pull that off, that would be a very, very big move. There's nothing to link Atlanta United to Moises Caicedo. Make that abundantly clear right now. There is nothing linking them at the moment. But he does fit a need, and he would be an amazing talent if you could get him. If he comes into the league, it's an amazing, it's an amazing move for Major League Soccer. Um, Ajax have been linked as well. I mean, it, it's there's a lot of different links here. But the sporting director at Independiente del Valle has made it clear that there has not been an offer from Manchester United. And everybody thought that Manchester United had this deal locked, that it was going to happen. So we shall see who it could be, but... um. If he comes to MLS, that's a huge move. Huge, huge move. And, yeah, I'd love to see him in Atlanta. Absolutely. Um, been really, really impressed with watching him play. Who else in MLS could benefit from a Caicedo as a part of their roster? Um, well, let's see. We go through and look at the list as we start to talk some MLS and, and stuff on this side of the hemisphere. Well, Austin, obviously... Uh, because they're new, although they did just pay a lot of money to bring in Alexander Ring, so probably not. Uh, Chicago would not, because they're set in that position. Uh, Cincinnati is set in that position right now with Madunian, and you don't commit as much resources to him and and go get a replacement at the moment. Um, He doesn't fit what we've seen from Colorado. They've also got Jack Price in that position. He wouldn't fit in Columbus. Dallas... Maybe, but I think this is out of the amount of money they usually spend, and they've got young players in that role that they should be playing anyway. Um, DC, they've also got young players in that role, and they've got Russell Canals. Houston would be a fit. They do have Matias Vera, who's in that role. Maybe they would decide they'd rather stick with that. LAFC would not fit, except they go out and get young South American talent on the regular. LA Galaxy would. He would be a little bit of the the same kind of thing you have in Jonathan Dos Santos, but potentially Miami, yes, because he'd be a huge upgrade on Victor Uyoa. Minnesota, eh. One, they're trying to sign Osvaldo Alonso back, but I don't think he's a regular at this point. Hassani Dotson can play that holding midfield role deep. But if you were able to get Caicedo, you would. I think they need other things more importantly, though. So I don't think Minnesota's the fit. So we're down to Miami, really. Galaxy, potentially. 
Montreal, no, because you have Piet. Nashville, no, because you have McCarty and Godoy. New England, maybe. You've got Luis Caicedo, who's coming back, and it looks like you're getting him a green card, so mm, probably not, but maybe. New York City, no, because you've decided to roll with, with Sands and Parks. Red Bulls don't spend that kind of money, although they should in this situation. And they really should to get him in the Red Bulls organization because if you spend it now to get him in and then you move him through the chain, it'd be a really intelligent move for the Red Bulls. They have not shown that style yet. They haven't shown that, that want to go out and get young South American talent and bring them through New York. So I don't think they're going to do it. Orlando... You've got Ari Russell, you've got Sebastian Mendez, you've got Andres Perea, you've got Junior Urso. Probably not, although he would be a player that Oscar Perea would love. But I just don't know if there's a fit there. Philadelphia, you know, you committed to, to Jose Martinez, and he was really good for you, so I don't think you necessarily need to go there. Diego Chara in, in Portland, probably not. Real Salt Lake's not going to spend that money right now. They don't have an owner. San Jose would be a fit, but are they going to spend that kind of money? They haven't. Seattle, probably not, although it's not completely crazy. I think they're trying to get the Joel Paulo deal done, and that's looking like it's going to be somewhat expensive. Sporting Kansas City, probably not. Toronto, probably not. Vancouver, I don't see them spending it. So there's not a lot. Yeah. There's not a lot of teams with big openings at the six. That's, you know, I mean, keep that in mind. But right. And that was why I wanted to ask. There's not a ton, so we will see. But uh, Moises Caicedo, keep an eye on it, because now it looks like it is starting to spread a little bit now to Europe that the sporting director has said they haven't gotten a deal from Manchester United. They haven't gotten an offer from Manchester United yet. Uh, this is going to get really interesting. He is one of the top young talents available in this window. No question. You, you mentioned young talent. A couple of folks have uh, let us know on Twitter and probably in the Twitch pitch as well. Uh, Ivis Galarcep, just before the top of the hour, says that uh, MLS is closing in on the bulk of their generation. Adidas class, Clemson midfielder Philip Mayaka, Virginia Tech midfielder Daniel Pereira, Wake Forest forward Calvin Harris are set to sign as members of the 2021 MLS generation Adidas class. Sources have confirmed to SBI. A fourth GA target, Stanford forward Usini Buddha, has turned down a GA offer from MLS. Yeah, this draft is going to be so weird. Um, it'll be a total crapshoot because you didn't really have a fall season outside of the ACC and the Sun Belt. You will have a spring season, and players can, if they sign a deal with the league, they can come straight into MLS. Um, if they have not signed a contract with MLS, they can play in the spring season, be drafted, and then come into the league. Generation Adidas is where you sign underclassmen to contracts, and they come in and they get some special uh, amounts of money that are a little bit separate. They also get some special roster rules. So this could get... This draft is going to be weird. I, I don't know even how to judge it at this point because of the, the just weirdness with the college season last fall. So I don't know. Um, another signing, um, Austin has signed Diego Fagundes, and that had popped up for a while. He spent his whole career in New England. He's a homegrown player for the Revs. Signed with him at like 14. So it feels like he's been in the league for 10 years because he has. Um, and he's still young. He's going to Austin. Big move. Um, that's a good one. I like Fagundes. I think he's a really talented player, but his relationship with the, the Revs really fell apart um, over the last couple of years. I think it started with Friedel. It didn't get a whole lot better with Arena. He needed a change of scenery. Absolutely needed a change of scenery. So he has moved on to Austin. That's a good get. Yeah, and you, since you're mentioning Austin, Galarsep said that Mayaka's emerged as the leading candidate to be selected first by Austin FC when the draft takes place on the 21st. Yeah, you've got a little bit more on him. You know, you did get to see a, a fall season with him, so you might feel a little more secure in that one. Uh, Turner chimes in and says the ACC is doing like a Super Cup to determine their automatic qualifier for the tournament. 
and the tournament is reduced this year. Uh, it'll be in the spring. It's not as big as it usually is on the men's or the women's side. So, you know, everybody's figuring it out. This spring for, for college sports in that regard, I have no idea what it looks like. Now, I don't know if you get full seasons done. I don't know if you have opt-outs. I don't know if you have teams that, you know, end up not making trips if they're already eliminated. Like, I, I don't know what it looks like. Hopefully, by the fall, for, for the college soccer frame anyway, it should be pretty normal, or at least manageable, to do a normal season in the fall. We'll see. Um, Byrne says uh, about uh, Caicedo, says, I'm not so sure Atlanta should get into another bidding war with European mega clubs for a young South American talent. Drives the price up too much. Um, see example A is Ecuador Barco. Different situation. We'll talk about it in a second. It says then you're stuck with a high price tag and can't move the player on. The right way is to sign a guy like Jose Martinez, who is unknown. Caicedo has emerged really quickly. He, he's a little different. Um, a year ago, you would have been able to get. He would have been 18. You would have been able to get Caicedo for you know a couple million, if that. Um, nobody really knew about him. He's emerged super fast. Um, and he's, he's special. He's, he's not a typical player to come along. Um, I really would go for it for him. And, and the numbers aren't getting into that realm yet. I mean, again, Manchester United reportedly was going to get him and it sounds like there wasn't ever an offer in the four to 5 million range. And now it's sounding like the club's asking 10. If you get him in the anywhere between six and 10 range, it's a very different conversation than what you paid 15 for Barco doesn't sound like a ton, but it, it is. It's a big difference. I, you can definitely make money on that. You might get him on less than you normally would now because of the pandemic and then be able to sell him at post-pandemic prices after a year or two, probably a couple of years, and really get a nice return on the investment. He's one I would make the investment in. Barco, you didn't get into a bidding war, and that's, that's what's a little awkward about that situation in general. The way it went down with Independiente is, by all accounts, Atlanta and Independiente had a deal done in principle before, I think, the semifinals of the Copa Sudamericana that year, maybe even earlier. It was done because people were already talking. I think Barco himself already kind of made some comments about leaving and the Atlanta thing was already there. It was all done. The, the bidding war wasn't with European clubs coming in. It was with Independiente and their leadership that <laughs> go ask Gustavo about it. They're, uh, they're not necessarily known for their, their top proper business practices. They wanted a whole bunch of more money after they won the Sudamericana. They tried to up the price, not because of other teams coming in, because they wanted more money after a deal was already done. And it was a back and forth and to the point that Barco didn't go to train because he had a deal done. He wanted to go. Yep. He said, I'm not coming in when the, the next bit of training started, and that was a back and forth. And, and they had to really push Independiente to get it done at the level that it did. And maybe they did pay a little bit more. But yeah, that one was really complicated. And Burns, right, that what, what also got into the Independiente's head was the Vinicius Jr. deal that happened at that same time. Because everybody's like, well, how is Real Madrid paying this much money for somebody who's not even playing in the Sudamericana final on a regular basis? while Barco's been one of the best players on the field in the Sudamericana final, and he's only going for this much. I think the Independiente people kind of got like, well, we can need to ask for more money. Yes. And they made sure that they didn't get too much more money. I don't know how much more they got. I'll, you know, I don't think we'll ever really know that. But it got super complicated. This is different. Um, there's always a risk with a young player. No matter you know, what level you buy him at, there's always a risk. Caicedo feels like more of a sure thing because he's not a... a a creative player in that regard, which it feels more hit or miss. He just, he feels like a prototypical central midfielder in today's game. And I think he could play the six in Gabriel Heinze's kind of system. Um, I think he could play an eight as well, depending on what you want out of him. I mean, he's just, he, he, he really feels like a special player. And I don't like to throw that around all that often. But in that kind of role, I, I really feel like he is a special player. And if you have the opportunity to get him at a probably reduced rate due to the pandemic, you jump on it in a heartbeat because you'll make your money back and more. I really believe that to be true. So then what's your price range? I mean, if you if you what is in taking the pandemic into account, 
if you're sitting there and you've got you've got the uh, you got the long short checkbook, the <laughs> you, know, okay. you don't want my checkbook getting this deal done because it ain't getting any deal done. The long short front office checkbook, the imaginary so, one. So the imaginary longshore front office checkbook. You can sit here and write a check out. You're sitting there saying, "Okay, what's what's your range? What would what would be your range for a player like that today?" Well, what's hard is we haven't seen MLS teams typically pay ten million dollars for a player in this position. Remember that U twenty two deal that's mm-hmm. coming in. Well, this is the kind of player that you want to use that on because. His salary, I mean, at, at Independiente del Valle, I don't know how much he's making a year. I'd probably be surprised if it's six figures. If you pay him 250000 a year, that's going to be a big raise for him salary-wise. He's probably going to get a cut of the transfer because that's typically what's in these kinds of contracts, too. Right. He'll be happy. And he would also know that he'd be going to a club like Atlanta, that has sent players on for bigger deals. And Miguel Almarone is one, and Pitti Martinez is another, and you know he would also know that they, they do right by their players with the Carlos Carmona deal and others. So that would be appealing to him. And the way this U22 thing is structured, according to what we know so far, if, if you pay 10, it doesn't matter. Like, it changes the, the paradigm here. Because... You know, even even with the designated player rule, it really truly doesn't matter once you commit that they're going to be a designated player to what you're going to spend. You know, if it if you believe in the player and it's going to cost you six million dollars a year on salary and twenty million dollars to get them in a transfer, let's say it's Christian Pavone, you're the LA Galaxy. It's going to cost you twenty to get him. You 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 argue, you negotiate, whatever. It's twenty to get him. You believe in him. You're committed to it. It's just how much you can spend. Because he's only going to count the maximum salary charge, 600000 or so. You can spend whatever you want. If you spend $5 million, if you spend $20 million, he's only going to count a certain amount against the cap. Right. So once you commit, it's in. And once you get into this U22 initiative side, it's not TAM, so you're not then doing the math. Once you commit that he's going to fill a role like that, cool. You do it. And he's one that I would do that for. 100%. This is why you create that initiative. For a player that has emerged very quickly to the point that maybe the European clubs are like, eh, you know, we don't really have a ton on this guy yet. You know, we're, we're a little skeptical because that's just how the European clubs are looking at, you know, South America. Eh, you know, he's not from Brazil, so, you know, we're not going to give you more than six. If MLS comes in and says, we'll give you eight, if it, if it takes ten, you're going to get that return. I think. I, I think your odds of getting the return are very good. There's no guarantees. He could break his leg. You know, you know how this stuff goes. He, he might yeah. not emerge. He might, he might be playing his best soccer of his life right now. These things are real, and they happen anywhere in the world. But it feels like a really safe investment, and it is a position of need for Atlanta. And it doesn't really matter. I mean, if, if he can fit into one of your U22 initiative spots, and you've decided he's a guy, I think he can come in and play. I mean, this is a guy who's playing Libertadores games. He's playing for Ecuador. Like, he doesn't need time. He would come in and play straight away. Boom. Ten, if it's 10, it's a steal. So it doesn't matter. If he fits U22, that's just fitting a spot. And you, you spend what you need to get him. Now you want to make sure you're spending an amount that you can get a return on. And if you're spending even up to 10, I think you can down the road. I think he's... He's a player you dream of to play in the central midfield in, in the modern game. He can play the transition game. He can defend. He can get forward. He's athletic. He, he's got size. Like he's, he's got everything you would want. He could go to England and play. He could go to Italy and play. He could go to Spain and play. He could go to Germany and play. He can play. Like He's legit. So if, if it's a possibility for MLS, and I'm just going to say MLS because I, there's no – direct team linked in any of the reports that I have seen from MLS. We went through the list of teams that would need a six because you're not bringing him in to learn. Yeah. That needs to be understood too, because I think that was some of the impression at different points. You're not bringing him in to be an understudy to somebody. You'd bring him in to play tomorrow. It'd be a huge get for MLS. It would be 
it would be the statement of intent with the U22 initiative that the league needs. Yeah, because, you know, what I think what this U22 initiative does is it gives you that extra column that you can play with when it comes to bringing in a talent like a Caicedo and like those others that would fit in that narrative or in that dynamic. It gives you that opening where we all we talk about MLS 3.0 and the, the advancement of the league and all this kind of stuff. And I think that U22, what it does is it allows you that extra lane of traffic where you can bring in players and you can fit them in and continue to grow your league, grow your franchise, and once again still send them off after a couple of seasons to Europe where they've established themselves. And you can have, you know, once again, you can have, if you're in Atlanta United, you can have another transfer that could be a top five in the history of the league by bringing in a player like this with this U22 initiative. Yeah, he, he absolutely could be that. He's he's that good that he could bring that kind of, of return down the road. Um, 100% could. Special player, special kid. You can get him, you, you jump in and get him. And if that if it's because the European teams are a, a little sketchy uh, on spending this kind of money, that's fine. You jump in and you do it. Um, there were some reports that the offer, the asking price from IDV, it increased from six million euro to ten million euro. Um, they also wanted a twenty percent sell-on clause. Uh, I'm I'm still on board with all of that. Uh, I'm still on board. It's seen seven point five and thirty percent sell-on. I mean, it, the numbers are all over the map and what this is going to potentially be. But with MLS in the mix, all hands on deck, get it done. <laughs> all hands on deck, get this deal done. A um, couple things that Mata Flo's pointed out that are important. He does really want to go to Manchester United because of his you know, idol, Valencia, who played at Manchester United. He would like to go to Manchester United. Um, but if there's not an offer on the table for Manchester United, well, then there's nothing you can do. Alaves has popped up as a club that Mataflo is seeing that, that could be interested for him. So seen Alaves, seen Manchester United, seen Chelsea, seen Ajax, seen Everton, seen Burnley. Uh, now I see another one with West Ham. Boca Juniors at one point was linked to him too, but it feels like maybe it's gotten past that. Um, very intriguing. So we'll, we'll keep you posted on it. He's, he's a special one. And it's very cool that MLS is even in this mix. I, I, I had been hoping for MLS to get into the mix and, and be mentioned alongside of it. They are. That's good. Um, it's good that the sporting director at Independiente del Valle is mentioning MLS in this. These are all good things. I hope they get the deal done. I hope he comes into the league. Current uh, exchange Sevilla, rate. Sevilla is another one that's come up I've seen. Yeah, your current exchange rate, 10 million euros, about 12 and a quarter U.S. And that's on the high side. And maybe it's less than that. I don't know. If that, I'd still, I'm, I'm still in. I'm still in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in. Um, at a minimum, it is good. Like, like and Matafla uh, agrees here that at a minimum, it's good that MLS is in the mix here. It, it shows that they are serious about getting the best young talent from this hemisphere, and that should be the goal. The U22 initiative. I don't want to see them go get overpriced young talent from Europe. If you get a good deal, great. If you get a good deal from an emerging country, an emerging team, great. It needs to be geared towards the best young talent from this hemisphere. The prices are better. The resale value is better. The conversion from one league to another is better. It is easier to come to MLS from Ecuador, from Argentina, from Uruguay, from Paraguay, than it is to come from Denmark or to come from Norway or to come from England or to come from Germany. Easier. Get it done. And this U22 initiative needs to get these kinds of guys. And even if they don't get Caicedo, because maybe he's special, maybe he gets past them. The guys in that realm, those 18, 19 year old talents in, in countries all over South America, those clubs need to know that, Hey, MLS is going to spend money on this and they're going to get yep. these young talents. Yeah, if you want to be taken seriously as a top twelve league, and you want to continue to grow, you want to be in these discussions. I mean, that's the, the bottom. That's the bottom line for me. As the continued growth of MLS in this hemisphere and in the world market, you want to be in these discussions. You want to be considered as a part of these discussions, so people can sit there and not ignore you in the world theater. It's like, no, I just want to go to Europe. No, MLS is a player, and here's an example why. 
it's better for the young talents in South America to come to MLS than to go to a European club and get loaned out. It's better for them to come here and play and elevate themselves and then get a bigger deal than to go somewhere because it's a big club and then get loaned out somewhere else. It's better to come here. And MLS needs to continue to drive that point home. And they need to continue to point to the, the resales on these guys. When that second move happens, you know what it's looking like for them and where they're going and how much more of a, a stronger position they're in. It's big. It's big. And, and you're pointing at all of it. You're pointing at Reggie Cannon. You're pointing at Mark McKenzie. You know, you're pointing at Miguel Almarone. You're pointing at Alfonso Davies. You're pointing at all of it. There's a bunch. There's a bunch. It's big. Uh, Sean Vergara shares, and I have not seen it just yet, ESPN FC is reporting that there were 40 positives in the Premier League this, this week. That would be by far the most. It would be double, I think, what last week was, which was the most. I think they were at 17 last week. I mean, it kind of goes along the lines, as, as John tries to confirm it, uh, of what we have been hearing about the spread uh, of, of things in, in England. And if the spread is in general more, then it's going to be more uh, across the Premier League. Now, mm-hmm. they have said the Premier League is not going to shut down. Um, you do have issues from a scheduling standpoint in this, and it is 40 positives out of... What's the number? Thank you, Sean, for sharing the uh, link from ESPN FC. Uh, Generally, they've been testing, and it doesn't have the full number yet. Generally, they've been testing in the 1,400 a week range, and that's players and staff. So 40 out of 1,400. You hear 40, it's like, ah, you hear 40 out of 1,400. Little different. It's still a lot. And the league's going to have to be very, very careful. And the players are going to have to, and the staffs are going to have to be very, very careful. You know, that none of it matters if, if, you know, as Ole Gunnar Solskjaer said recently when he was asked about this, you know, he understands and he's tried to make this point to his players that they are very lucky to be able to continue with what they're doing. And they all want to. They want to play, even without the fans, even without the situation that they're accustomed to. They want to play. It's normalcy for them. That's what they want. But you have to follow the protocols, and that's why the teams have to really crack down on the people who aren't. Or they had a holiday party or... They're they're doing stupid things. So they they need to understand that right now, you know, it's a scary time in the UK. That's why they just went into another lockdown. So you know, it's it's something you have to be incredibly careful with, and, and we'll see if they do it. But it's going to be hard for them to shut down for any period of time because they don't have the time in the calendar to do it. You know, you're not going to see. I I don't think you're not going to see the Euros, Copa America, Gold Cup shift very much this summer. I don't think they can afford to. So the Premier League season is going to have to end at a certain point for players to be able to go to their national teams, and you're going to run out of time if you have a shutdown of a period of time. That's just how it is. I I don't, you know, and you can only play so many midweek games. I I don't know what the fix is, but it's the world we're in right now. Uh, Everton, Manchester City, and these are the postponements so far. Everton, Manchester City, December 28. Tottenham, Fulham, December 30. Burnley, Fulham, January 3. All forced to be postponed so far because of outbreaks at City and Fulham. For me, I want to keep an eye on Fulham because of right now you've got two postponements on the board. And if you're in a relegation fight and you're having to deal with additional schedule compression, I want to keep an eye on on Fulham as we go here for the season. Uh, Sky has the results of all of the, the rounds of testing. Round 18. 40 positives, just under 2,300 tested. The previous, December 21 through 27, 18 positives with just under 1,500 tested. Week before that, seven tested, 1,569, uh, seven positives, 1,569 tested. That's December 14 through 20. Six positives the round before that, December 7 through 13. Week before that, 14 positives under just uh, 1,500 tested. So uh, the last testing positive numbers, 40, 18, 7, 6, 14. That gets us through December. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just where it is. It's where things stand right now. Almost double. How many tests did they do this week? Did you have that? I'm sorry. 2,295, 40 positives. Okay, so it's not quite double how many tests they normally do, but it is more, so they had more positives. Okay, that needs to be factored in here too. 
Um, maybe more fixtures, Jason Nick says. Could be. Maybe just more tests because of the situation in the community, too. And that, all that's fine. Um, more tests can get you know more positives. That that is that is true. If they're still positive. <laughs> like yeah. if, so, if you mean, don't the test them and they're positive, it's still a problem. You're you're looking at fifty or sixty percent more tests, and so if you extrapolate fifty percent more positives, eighteen would take you to twenty seven or thirty. So it's, it's a little more, more than the fifty percent right. correlation. Yep. It, it's it, it's not a good situation. Um Miguel Delaney said it's two rounds of testing combined that, th- that this is. So 40, if you split everything in half, it'd be 20. That's still a little bit more than it would have been. Yeah. So, But it's not 40 out of nowhere in one round of testing. That, that right. does need to be understood for context. That's important. Yeah. Um, we have not gotten into Sergio Ramos yet. <laughs> and, uh, no. And this thing's funny. Um, this is going to be a big soap opera in general because, yes, like him or not, Sergio Ramos is a big deal at Real Madrid. You've got reports. ESPN said Manchester City's monitoring a situation. Other sources said, no, City's not interested. Um, Spanish TV last night, uh, El Chiringuito TV uh, dropped a bomba. That's bomba. what they do. Um, it's a fun watch. It's on Fox Deportes in the United States, by the way. I didn't know that until fairly, pretty recently. Uh, Josep Pedrol is the main person there. And he said that, in his bomba, that Ramos, one, has not taken a deal at Real Madrid yet. But Ramos told Florentino Perez in these arguments, and Perez is the president at Real Madrid, if you don't know. Ramos told Perez that PSG told him that they would build the team around Ramos and Lionel Messi, and that PSG would come in and get both. Um, Most accounts, and Marca had this this morning, that he has been offered a one-year contract extension for roughly the same amount that he makes now, more than 12 million euro per season. There's still the 10% pay cut that the team is going to take. That needs to be taken into account. Would he have 10% cut off of that, or would they bump his number up to account for that? Yeah, Real Madrid's taking a 10% pay cut. Um, keep this in mind with the MLS conversation, too, because you got Real Madrid taking a 10% pay cut. You got Ligue 1 and the French Players Association meeting Thursday to talk about what they're going to do. Now, they've got the broadcast issue, but oof. So, Ramos, one year deal. He wants a longer deal, it sounds like. There were some reports that. He had been offered a two-year deal, but at a cut rate. Now, talks were regarded January 1st as normal. Everything seems to have changed in the last day. He's turned down the one-year extension. The club understand that. They understand he's going to listen to other offers. They don't want to offer him more. They're only willing to offer a year-by-year basis with him. Um, that's what they generally do for players over 30. Um, Pedrol said that Florentino Perez believes that no offer will come for, from PSG for Sergio Ramos. At least that's what PSG is telling Real Madrid directly. According to Ramos, PSG have told him directly that they're going to put a great team together around him and Messi. And, and Pedrol said that, that Florentino's position is that if that's the case, Ramos should go to PSG. And, and that's kind of crazy to me. I mean... Does he think that's what's best for for Real Madrid? Does he think that's what's best for Ramos? Does he think that they can't match whatever offer PSG would be offering, and they shouldn't? So if he can go make you know more money and get more of a guarantee that he should go, I don't know. Um, it doesn't look good, and and a couple of Real Madrid fans in the Twitch pitch, I'm I'm with you on this one. They've got to treat their their club legends a little bit better than this. This is a bad look. Ramos to PSG with Messi is what he said, and I guess Neymar and Mbappe would stay as well. Super club. Yeah. I mean, you put that together, Mauricio Pochettino is going to be pretty happy. Going to have a lot of pressure on him, but pretty happy. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued. I, I want to see how this continues to play out, so stay tuned. I mean, I, I think the one thing that maybe we're – we're not being clear on is they can sign a pre-contract. There's a bunch of guys who are going to be out of contract in the summer, a lot more than usual. They can sign a pre-contract 
any time from now. So it's not like they're tied by the transfer window, which will end at the end of the month. You know, if they don't get a deal done, they could sign one later. They could sign one in March if Ramos sits down with PSG at that point. And that could happen with some of these. They could also wait till their contract's up and then just start negotiating. And that's what Messi has said he, he would want to do, is wait for the presidential election, finish the season, and then he'll figure out what he's going to do next year. And that could come up too. And if Messi waits, and if PSG wants to put together the super team, maybe Ramos has to wait. And, and you could have a lot of dominoes that, that are affected here. It could get really interesting. Nathan Pugh on the Twitter side says, I believe you referred to Sergio Ramos as the heart and soul mm-hmm, of Madrid. Joke's on you, Jason. Sergio Ramos has no soul. Evil laughing uh, oh, gift to follow. just because he injured Mo Salah. <laughs> Liverpool fans still really, really in their feelings about that. I understand. Ramos is one of the best defenders that, that we've seen in a long time. Um, and look, maybe some of it is just down to the intangibles of his leadership. But Real Madrid looks like a different team when he's in that in that team and on the pitch. They completely do. Spain has looked that way too. So there's something about him. He's he's doing something right. Uh, some other silly season rumors and reports that are out there. Christian Eriksen, sad Christian Eriksen, still trying to be happy somewhere. Uh, Sky yeah, Italia Wolves. is reporting that Ajax has started discussions with him. Wolves has been mentioned with Ericsson. Those are the latest two, which is a little bit of a step down from some of the rumors that were out there about Ericsson before. Uh, David Alaba, there had been reports yesterday that it, like a deal was done with Real Madrid. Maybe not the case. Fabrizio Romano said that those talks are progressing, but Liverpool are among the five clubs that have contacted Alaba about signing him for next summer. He's not going to leave anywhere in January. Um, he wants to go to Real Madrid, is what Romano says. I, most reports are that that's either done or almost done. I think he's going to end up at Real Madrid. Uh, Olivier Giroud, Sky Sports reports that Juventus are interested in signing him right now, in the January window. 34 years old, eight goals in his last eight appearances. He's out of contract in the summer. He has been given assurances he will play regularly if he stays. Maybe he would like a new contract if he stays. That would probably be the thing that would give him more assurances. Um, Juventus are looking for a forward. They have a short list of forwards that they are looking for. Giroud is on it. Milik from Napoli is on it. Fernando Llorente is on it. Hmm. I don't see Chelsea selling him. Nope. I don't see Chelsea letting him go right now, but... If they don't offer him a new deal, does he force his way out? He might put their feet to the fire on that. And they're not in a position to really have a whole lot of leverage at the moment because of where things stand at the moment with Frank Lampard and where things are going. It's going to be weird. Uh, Kefsi is joining the uh, Liverpool anti-Sergio Ramos train, and he's not even a Liverpool fan. There's a lot of people who don't like Sergio Ramos. I just have fun uh, picking at the Liverpool fans who don't like him sometimes. It's entertaining. Um, he's very, very good. And he's also very, very, uh, polarizing. Totally understand it. Um, maybe I was won over by the, uh, PR mini series that they did for him on, uh, Amazon prime. I actually kind of liked it. Maybe I, I feel a little bit differently about Sergio Ramos because of that. They did their job. Um, a couple other bits of news, random stuff, uh, before we get into questions and, and wrap up. RB Leipzig uh, are not going to get Dominic Schoboslai into the team just yet. He's got an abductor injury. Um, he was nursing it at Salzburg. He's going to miss this Saturday. He's probably going to miss the, the month of January. And that's according to Derek Ray. Um, in Spain... Atletico Madrid is fighting the 10-week suspension that Kieran Trippier got from the English FA. It has been put on hold by FIFA, according to an Atletico source over the weekend. He was suspended 10 weeks, fined 70,000 pounds for four breaches of a rule which prevents players from providing information to others on their position, which is not available in public at the time. Um, Trippier said that he, is, he did not place any bets or profit from bets placed by others. Not exactly answering the the question, but I don't know. I, I want to say that this was related to a bet placed on him going to Atletico. And it was somebody in his family that probably got a lot of money out of it. 
So they're saying that he gave the information. Um, it's been put on hold, and right now Atleti is thinking they're going to get to play him. Brother, thank you, Strummer John. I, I couldn't remember which family member it was. Um, we'll see. It's kind of a weird one. I don't know how you can really eliminate those things. I, I just I don't know. Oh, I, I don't know. What do you do? You not talk to your family anymore and sit there? Well, you know, I can't say anything. Of, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, are you going to go to go to Let's Go Madrid? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know anything. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Nothing. know. Nope. Nothing. It, that's kind of tough. Um, also on the Atleti side, I thought this was an interesting stat. Luis Suarez has been involved in 11 goals in his opening 12 games for Atleti. Nine goals, two assists. Best starting run for an Atleti player in this century, passing Falcao in 2011, who had nine goals and one assist. I'd say that deal's worked out pretty well. Yeah. On a free. Good job, Barcelona. Nice job. The uh, Luis Suarez revenge train is pretty strong. <laughs> pretty, pretty strong. Uh, what do we have on the Twitters that we have not touched on? A couple of things. Uh, Turner Kirby with a question having to do with New York State athletics. Okay. If, if you're NYCFC or the Mets or the Yankees, how hard do you push to have fans since they're allowing fans for the Bills playoff games? Also, how would you respond if the state says no and says the Bills were a special exemption? Exemption. What can the Bills do that they can't? Um, if you're any of the ones in an outdoor stadium, that there's nothing the Bills can do outside of the percentages that would be different. You know, if you're hockey or or the the Knicks or the Nets, it's a different conversation because of the indoor outdoor thing. Um, the other thing that could make it different between the two is just the spread of the virus when baseball or, or MLS starts. You know, it could be worse to where you, you can't have fans, and maybe you could here. That'd be a bit of a surprise, but anything's possible at this point. Um, if they allow it for the Bills and everything else is pretty much the same and they don't allow it for the others, yeah, I don't see that happening, and they should absolutely fight it. I was a little surprised they allowed it for the Bills. You, you can't allow it out of sentimentality during a pandemic. If they can do it safely, and we have seen it done safely in different situations, okay, fine. If you can't, you can't do it. But you can't do it because, man, we'd really like to do it, and, and we know it's kind of risky, but we'd really hope to do it. No, you can't do that. And I hope that's not what they're doing. I think it's a 10% capacity is what they're allowing. I think 6,750 for the playoff game in Buffalo. And I don't know, and 3TH has a point that I'll take it a step further from uh, 3TH's about the, the population density of Buffalo versus New York City. The, the, te- the, the positive rates in Buffalo and New York City could be very different too. And if they are different, then that would be another thing that the state could say is it's Buffalo, it, it's not the Bronx or it's not Manhattan. So I could, and I could understand that. I could totally understand that too. Uh, Swixter off of my top of the hour read for Apolinsky says that the promo for uh, my read was like, if Kerry Strug had been forced to stick the landing right off the bat after the injury. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it, it started bad and it never got better. Uh, Turner Kirby also brings in a, a graphic that says you can see the master class of Big Sam at work on this chart. Oh, Average no. chance quality. Yeah. And there are a couple of teams, and one of them is Schalke. Schalke create very low amount of chances a game. Chance quality is also very poor. And it looks like West Brom is right there with Schalke, right there in the low corner of the graph. Top five leagues, chance creation. Oof. Bottom three, West Brom is right there. And that's not all of Big Sam's handiwork. Uh, there, there were you know previous efforts to put them there. <laughs> I don't think Big Sam's raised that number. Maybe he's taking it lower. The uh, average chance quality is slightly better. It's better than Schalke. It's the only one it's better than. But the volume is is even lower. <laughs> so, yee, it's really yes. bad. Who is uh who is West Brom right there with? Oh goodness! See, I can't now tell from the, the graph. Thing up. Yeah, I, I can't tell off offhand. It's pretty is bad. There, is there a way to blow up a graphic? Uh, it's way too complicated to try to explain to you. 
Yeah, so that would take too long. Yeah, yeah, it's no good. Um, okay. Maybe Alaves? No, I can't tell. Okay, anyway. Um, Big Sam doing his thing. Yes, Big Sam's doing his thing. And uh, Tafka has a thought this morning talking about the draft. Uh, Atlanta's draft strategy will be interesting this year and in all future years. We have put so many top players into college who qualify as homegrown signings that Tafka's curious how often we'll actually draft, in quotation marks, players versus signing former academy players. Asensio, Brighton, Scholl, Garces, Edwards, Bryce Washington, three of those are listed top 25 in college rankings, and more and more are coming in the coming years. Hold that thought for a second. Holding. <laughs> Uh, Ivis Galarsa, some good news awaits Sounders fans this week. Ivis is told that Seattle and Brian Schmetzer have reached an agreement on a new contract. Not a, not a surprise. Um, I mean, when, when Schmetzer said that he would bet on being there next year, it kind of gave you a pretty good impression. Um, let's see. Sounds like it's been finalized. I was looking to see if there was a length. I guess at least a couple of years. Um. Doesn't say. So we'll, we'll see when that gets officially, officially announced. But the, the chances of him leaving would have been so remote. He doesn't want to work anywhere else. This is, you know, it's home. Um, it didn't make any sense for Seattle unless they were trying to cut costs to go in a different direction. Now, you know, the, the question will be Pineda, and he's still in the mix in D.C., or does he want to continue to work in Seattle with maybe that idea that he is the coach in waiting in Seattle, and that would be an interesting, you know, component to this. Because how long does Schmetzer want to keep doing it? I don't know. I don't have an answer. I mean, you know, he's been in in the job with the Sounders in MLS since the middle of 2016. But I mean, this is a guy who was managing in USL for a long time before that. He was the assistant for the Sounders since they came into the league. So I mean, he's been at it a long time. Uh, how old is he? Sixty-two, three, in that ballpark. Yeah. Yeah, in that ballpark of a little effort, the man. Okay, double check. Um, you know, does he want to? Does he want to go till seventy? Does he want to go? You know, does this is this the last contract he's going to sign? Does he want to do a two or three year run? Fifty eight. Oh, okay, he's younger than I thought. Okay, well maybe not. Um, but I don't see him wanting to go anywhere else. That's the biggest thing. Is it's not like he's going to want to go. I guess Europe would be great for him if he got the opportunity, but would he? Yeah. Um, don't know. But he's not going to go anywhere else in MLS. He's not going to go anywhere else in this country. So does he want to prepare the next guy? I don't know if he has that mentality or not. Um, being 58 instead of a little bit older like I thought he was, then maybe if, if the job's there for Pineda, he needs to go elsewhere. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's going to be an interesting conversation because Pineda is really well regarded. He's still in that mix in D.C., which it sounds like there's no real update on where things stand in D.C., I don't know what direction they're going to go, but maybe this at least gives some clarity in everything. And if they want to go get Pineda, then they go get him. I'd like to see what Pineda can do. I've just, I've heard a lot of good things. I mean, we haven't seen him work as a number one guy in the league. I'd like to see him get that opportunity. And it sounds like somebody like Pineda or Pineda himself is the direction DC will go in. I don't see an international manager coming in there. I don't see a big name going in there. I think it will be an assistant getting their first job. And Pineda would be the one outside of Ezra Hendrickson that would seem to be the biggest fit. And it seems like they like Pineda more than Hendrickson. Yeah, last night Stephen Goff posted the update. Uh, one person familiar with the search said the pool of candidates remains substantial as the club weighs new contenders from abroad. United has spoken to at least 20 candidates since October. Quoting Goff, the process has taken so long, jokes have circulated around the soccer community that United will end up rehiring Ben Olsen. They're not. It's a joke. That's what, that's what uh, I know, saying. but some people will. Ah! He's going to go to Sheffield Wednesday anyway. And uh, from all indications, Pineda, Pat Noonan, uh, United's top domestic-based candidates, MLS assistants Pineda, Pat Noonan in Philly, plus Red Bulls coach Chris Armas, uh, Jill Ellis, uh, though neither she nor the club are convinced as the right fit, uh, uh, three people said. So Jill Ellis was a part of the mix. It remains in the mix but uh, not convinced as the right fit on either side. Uh, Chad Ashton, not ruled out, considered right. a long shot. Uh, names uh, outside of international, Manchester City assistant Rodolfo Burrell, yeah, under serious consideration, have not surfaced internationally. Don't see it. 
Um, Turner asked if it's drifting into Tennessee coaching search territory, and it's, it's getting there. It's getting pretty close. Okay, back to Tofka's thing on, on the college side, because this will be the first time since year one that Atlanta has a, a high first-round pick, and you can take advantage of that. So this year might be different, but Tofka said the draft strategy will be interesting to watch. So many you know, good players who went into college that could qualify as homegrowns, it's not either or would be the only thing I would say is you could sign your top guys that go on to college as homegrowns instead of them going into the draft, and you can use your draft pick. So this year, for example, um, Chol would be, let's see, Brighton Asensio got more time, Garces has got more time, Edwards is still young. I think Bryce Washington's a senior, too. So, Chol and Washington would be the seniors going into the draft that you could sign to homegrowns. I believe Washington will qualify because he spent a full year in the academy. So, I think he would qualify as a homegrown. Uh, Chol is the same. I, I think both of them qualify. So, you could sign both of them if you wanted to as homegrowns and then still use your, what is it, number five pick? Now, this year, as Tofka points out, it would be a potential trade chip. In a normal year, I think it'd be a great trade chip if you make that decision. You know what? We don't want to add a college kid from outside of our system in addition to the homegrowns we're going to sign coming out of college, and this this pick has value. I don't know what it has value for this year because it's just such a weird year. If you are happy with signing Conway, if you decide, and, and I didn't see as much of Washington in college, I'm going back to more of what I saw from him in the academy where he was raw. Did well in college. I think he, he transferred at one point. Very athletic uh, center back. Um, great size. I, I'd need to see more of him on the ball to have a, a real opinion there. Chole, I think, is is really interesting talent. Um, and I'm probably a little biased because I remember Machope Chol as a very, very skinny little kid in Clarkston um, coming out and playing in street cups with soccer in the streets and playing at the Decatur YMCA. I, I remember him as a very small, skinny little boy. He is not a small, skinny little boy anymore. <laughs> he, he grew fast in terms of height. and It took the rest of his body some time to catch up. We saw that with the academy where very tall, very lanky, very difficult to defend because he's a great dribbler, great 1v1, and his his combination of, of height and, and quickness with his feet was really difficult. At Wake Forest, he's added some some size. You know, he he's he's not a, a little guy who's going to get knocked off the ball really easily anymore. So, Joel could absolutely be a homegrown signing. I I would not be blown away to see that. And if you decide, you know what, we've added these young guys, we don't want to go add another one, there's not somebody in the draft that we think you know, would, would fit what we want to do, we'll trade it. That's fine. There could be somebody in the draft that they think would fit what they want to do. And, and that's what's getting interesting about the college game is you're seeing so many international players come. And you know, we've seen Atlanta hit on a Julian Gressel who had a, a German academy background, so it was easier for him to make that transition to the pro game. I think that was the idea with Patrick Nielsen, uh, but injuries just made it so difficult for Nielsen to get going, and we barely saw him consistently with the twos last year. That you know, it, it's just unlucky with him. But he was a guy who came from an academy system. You know, is is there a, a top young player that, that comes out of an academy system out of the draft that you think would fit? Is there a generation Adidas guy that you might want to see if he falls to you that you think would fit? If there is, cool. If not, if you can trade it and, and somebody else could use that player to come in and, and play like a Henry Kessler did for the Revs last year or others, then do it. I think you might wait till draft day to see what comes up. It doesn't have to be either or, and this draft is so unpredictable that I think you want to hold on to the pick as long as you can to see what you can get. Uh, Ricky Ricardo lets us know that Jerry Zagoda up at the Minneapolis Star Tribs is expecting the Loons to finalize the signing of Will Trapp today. Still discussing a playing role for Ozzy Alonzo as well. Yeah, I, I could see Alonzo being part time and Will Trap becoming the guy there. It really changes the way they, they play. Um, and I want to see how that fits with, with Grey Goosh and with Reynoso. Um, I think it can. I think Grey Goosh can be the Artur 
that Trap used to have in Columbus um, that can do a lot of the other work. Trap can be the metronome in possession, which is very different than what he got from Alonzo. I think you're going to have to be better defensively than the Loons have been because Trap is not as good defensively as Alonzo has been on a regular. Um, maybe Alonzo becomes a, a late game sub for Trap. Maybe Alonzo becomes a spot starter against certain competition for Trap. It'd be interesting to see. If they can make it all work, that's a good squad. That's a good midfield. You got a lot of variety in it. One other thing that's popped up, Kicker in Germany is reporting, and this could be a very interesting one for a few teams that are looking for center back help right now. Jurgen Klopp. <coughs> Bayern Munich, Javi Martinez could be allowed to leave before his contract expires in the summer of 2021. I uh, almost went to Athletic Bilbao in the summer. He's saying he wants to go. They're not going to offer a contract extension, and they would be willing to move him on now. Now, so far, the only interest has been shown from China. But if you need a center back badly to come in, and he's only played about 600 minutes this year, you know, I mean, you know, he's a World Cup winner. You need somebody to come in for six months, and then you can make a decision on, on re-signing them to a new deal. Maybe you can find a good about amount of money to make that one happen. It shouldn't be too expensive. Just saying, Jurgen. Just saying. <coughs> just saying. <coughs> Why are you coughing when I say that? Just saying. <coughs> I wasn't like doing the cough and say it like underneath it. I was just just saying. That's all. Just saying. No, so I'm, yeah. I was like, are you, did you get sick? I mean, what what's going on? Nope. No, no. It's not good. Although I did forget to turn on the fake fireplace down here in Office HD this morning. Oh, good times. Uh, Turner had asked a question before the power hour got canceled due to uh, my sore throat said, uh, could we potentially see Conway in U.S. Open Cup play and maybe early CCL if Joseph still isn't good to go? Absolutely could. Um, I mean, Conway showed in USL play this year. He showed in the game against Club America. He can play, and he can play at, the, at this level. Is he Joseph? No, he's not. He's young. He's a different kind of player, but is, is the occasion too big for him? I don't think it is. Open Cup, easy for Conway. I don't have a problem with that. Early CCL, depending on who the draw is, no problem with that either. Um, I think the the difference with Gabriel Heinze coming in in charge of this team, Tata Martino would not have played him. He wouldn't. He was very reluctant to play his younger players, even in Open Cup stuff at times. Um, or then he'd just throw everybody young into Open Cup, and it was just a total mishmash. CCL, he wouldn't have done it. League play, he wouldn't have done it. Uh, Frank showed more willingness to do it. I think Heinze will show even more. It'll be the best players available. And yeah, he'll have to manage, you know, players' minutes and things like that, and he'll have to manage Joseph coming back from injury. If if Conway shows he's ready, he'll play. No question about that for me. Yeah, and that's one of the things I'm looking forward to with uh, the younger players. It's like, all right, who's who's stepping up and who uh, Gabriel Heinze is uh, looking forward to, to throw into the lineup when they when he senses that they're ready. That's part of this whole dynamic that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, it's going to be fun to see. Um, Turner asked about the CCL draw. Usually it would have been done by now. Um, I'm wondering, as Turner asks, if they're waiting for the uh, Canadian Championship game to get played. They could be, or at least waiting for it to get scheduled. I think they're waiting to see if they're going to be able to start when they normally do. And I'm guessing because they haven't done the draw that maybe they're going to push back the start of it. The thing about CONCACAF champions league is you need to have a a winner by the time the club world cup starts um, for next year in December. So if it needs to be pushed back even into the second half of the year and yeah, I know MLS teams won't like that, but if that's what it is, that's what it is. It can get moved. So I'm wondering if, they're waiting Canadian Championship. They're waiting maybe for the 2020 Club World Cup. It's going to be in February. Waiting for all of that and then doing it. We'll find out. Um, but I've not seen anything from CONCACAF about that. Now, real quick, you mentioned CONCACAF. Quickly, no real surprise. They've canceled the 2020 Under-17 okay. qualifiers and championship and the 2020 CONCACAF Under-20 championship because of FIFA announcing the cancellations of the U-17 and the U-20 Men's World Cups. No no need to do those because you don't have to have winners to go into the, the Club World Cup, so you don't have the money to necessarily do it right now. It's too hard to do it right now. You, you move on. 
Um, that's just what you have to do. Uh, RSL has officially announced that Pablo Mastrini is now an assistant at RSL. They had to pay 50000 in GAM to Houston to get the deal done because he was the assistant there and he was under contract. Uh, some RSL fans are, are maybe not happy about this because of the rivalry between the Rapids where Mastrini was a player and manager um, and RSL. Eh. I mean, it's kind of funny. These things happen sometimes. I, I've i heard good things about Master Any as an assistant. I have. And while his teams were not exactly fun to watch, in an assistant role, if he's focusing on the defense, which he did well in Colorado, okay. Don't have a problem with that. We'll see how he works with Freddie Juarez. Uh, it's an interesting move for Master Any. You know, I wondered if he would try to get another head coaching job, but he's went down a different road. He's focused on being an assistant. I think he's trying to focus on on learning the, the whole craft. So I like it. Uh, the Will Trap deal is done with Minnesota. That's been officially announced now. So all kinds of stuff popping off in the MLS world. We have not heard anything about force majeure or anything with, with those meetings yet either. So stay tuned on that. Uh, tonight, you got the Copa Libertadores first leg of the semifinal between River and Palmeiras. 730, if you are a member of our Discord, there will be a watch-along talking about this one as it happens. This one is being played not at El Monumental because they're still renovating it, taking the track out. It's going to be played at Independiente Stadium, but it is the home leg for River. They are a sizable favorite over Palmeiras. Uh, minus 133 is what I'm seeing. Palmeiras plus 400. The draw is plus 230. This is the first leg. Second leg will be next week. River comes in after dropping points to Boca. They had the lead at 2-1. They gave up a late goal. Palmeiras comes in in good form. Palmeiras is one of the teams and probably the one that it sounds like Gabriel Heinze turned down to take the Atlanta job. Um, you might want to look and compare. I mean, Palmeiras is a good young team, a very good young, talented team, one of the heavyweights in Brazil right now. This is a big one. Santos playing Boca tomorrow. Santos doesn't come in in as good a form. Boca has, is coming in in really good form. I think Boca is more of a favorite in their series than River is against Palmeiras. This one feels a little bit more even. I'll shade it to River, and, and a lot down to the experience of being in these situations. But this could be dicey. River needs, in a perfect world, to win by two tonight. With no you goals can, conceded. Yeah, you can get River as low as minus 110 by comparison to your minus 133. You mentioned the plus 400. You can get them as low as, from the same bookmaker, a plus 312 for Palmeiras. Interesting. I'm leaning River... I don't know if they get the two-goal win without conceding that they would really like to have. You'd like to have as much of a cushion going to Brazil as you possibly could. That's going to be tough. If they get out of there without conceding, even if it's 1-0, you're going to feel good about it. If it's 2-1, you're not going to feel as good about it because yeah. of that away goal situation. It, it will be a good one to watch. It's on the BN Family Networks. It's also on Fanatis fntz.co slash soccer down here. If you need to get signed up, you can get a free seven day trial. If you have not signed up for them before, or you can subscribe. Um, if you go through that link, it does help the show. And we really, really appreciate it. Fanatis has been a, a great partner of ours and I've had their product for as long as I've known it existed. Um, so got me hooked. It's how I watch the Argentine league. It's how I watch, um, Copa Libertadores. It's how I watch everything on BN, which is La Liga, which is Liga. Um, it's been vital for me. And I mean, they've got some other little things that kind of fly under the radar. If you're a Real Madrid fan, they have Real Madrid TV in English and Spanish. Um, they have Sevilla TV in Spanish as well. They have uh, Tigo Sports out of Guatemala with games out of Guatemala. Um, they have, I, I always forget about it because it's not a well known network that's got the Austrian Bundesliga. They have that on Fanatis as well. So if you want to watch Red Bull Salzburg, you want to watch Jesse Marsh, you can watch it easily on Fanatis. you got all kinds of stuff on Fanatis. Um, and they archive games too. So if you miss it live, you can go back and watch it um, archived. fntz.co slash soccer down here. That's going to do it for this morning. We'll have the watch along on Discord. If you're a subscriber on Twitch, if you're a subscriber on Patreon, and you haven't gotten set up with the Discord, 
please give me a heads up. I'll get you get you clued into that. 7.30 for Libertadores action tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with a wall pass Wednesday at 9 o'clock. Maybe more moves in MLS before the day is out. Maybe more moves around the silly season and craziness. Uh, maybe more updates on Moises Caicedo. I'd love to see him linked to Atlanta. I'm really crossing my fingers and hoping. We'll have to see what happens, but uh, we'll talk about it in the morning. Thanks for hanging out. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata, y'all.